Welcome to Flow Stars, candid conversations between Dr. Peter O'Toole and the big hitters of flow cytometry. Brought to you by Beckman Coulter at Bite Size Bio. Welcome to this special episode of Flow Stars. I'm joined by Margaret Mabuchi from the Kenya Medical Research Institute and from Karen Hogg from the University of York. And we're going to discuss flow cytometry in Africa. So join us to hear the major logistical challenges that come with shipping cytometers and reagents to Kenya, Sudan, Ethiopia and Uganda. I think the biggest challenge could probably describe as um, uh, transportation of instruments and reagents then to the sites. Now that was partly due to COVID, but also the restrictions and the processes and the licenses and the certifications for each of the four countries to actually ship the cytometers and the reagents was different. The difficulties of recruiting study participants in areas of civil unrest. The study sites where we are doing uh, the recruitment uh, study participants are in a you know, in a zone where, we, as I said, that the, 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 the visceralish analysis in our settings affects the you know, nomadic communities. So sometimes you have two communities that are always fighting and you know, cattle rustling, and, you know, and it can be turned very, very nasty. So we have had some curfews. And learn how you can get involved and donate second-hand instruments. So if you have a look at the ISAC website, then there are details there for the chairpersons or the information. Um, so you can, can look at that and then email the, the chairs of the groups if you've got um, comments or you've got instruments that you think would be suitable for donations, then you know get in touch and we can send you details as to what information is needed. All in this episode of Flow Stars. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York and welcome to this episode of Flow Stars. This is slightly different. This is a, an Africa special and looking at flow cytometry and some of the initiatives and challenges and exciting developments happening at the moment. And today I'm joined by Margaret Mabushi from the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kemri from Kenya, and Karen Hogg, who actually works with me back at the University of York, but has a heavy involvement with Margaret and others across East Africa. Welcome to you both. Margaret, firstly, how are you? I'm very fine, Peter. Thank it's, you. Uh, really nice to see you again. And Karen, how are you today? You're just back off your holidays. How are you, Karen? Yeah, I am very good. Thank you. It was nice to have a couple of weeks off and to get back to things and, and move the, the work along. So, yeah, good. Thank you. So I, I'm going to kick off because actually, Margaret, I think it's been a little while since we've spoken. Uh, how, how is so we obviously share a few flow cytometers. How is your flow cytometer behaving? Is, is everything good? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we have had a good time with our flow cytometer and we are running our samples well. We haven't had any major issues. And whenever we have had any issues, we have uh, our team from uh, the representatives of Beckman Kulta come quickly to sort it out for us. But that has been minimal. Otherwise, our, man our machine is working well. Uh, that's really good to hear. Because I think, <clears throat> so for the listeners, uh, one of the reasons that Karen and I got involved with Margaret and others was through a, a grant, uh, EDCTP, so European funded grant uh, with Paul K at York, leading York's end, and then Margaret and others from across Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Sudan. And we all bought the same cytometers at the same time. And that was quite a challenge in picking, not necessarily the best cytometer in the world, but what we thought would be uh, the best cytometer to be delivered across different labs and be reliable and well serviced and everything else. And Margaret, it sounds like, it looks like our choice that we all chose was a good one. Yes, I think uh, you, the choice was a good one. W which is a relief because it's a lot of money when you're buying five at once. <laughs> and Karen, you, you, you know better than I do because actually you kind of project manage this locally on the cytometer side. Uh, from York, and you have a lot of interaction with all of those hubs, nodes uh, across East Africa. 
So how 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 do you, how do you manage that? <laughs> well, that that's managed across a few different platforms. So we use Zoom meetings to have um, sort of team weekly meetings if people can dial in or use their internet to, to meet so we can discuss what's going on with the project and how the cytometers are and share tips, tricks, experiences of training. So that's, that's one method. Um, we also use WhatsApp as well um for little quick communications or sharing videos which um, has been really useful videos how to change tubings change filters and do some of the maintenance tasks on the cytometers um and so that's been really good um and i've been out to kemri as well to do some training and margaret and jane and the team very kindly hosted me out there while i trained a new member of staff so it's been a real mix and actually, I should point out uh, later on, we'll concentrate on some of the difficulties. Uh, technological difficulties are hitting us today as well as I speak. So actually, those listening won't have a clue there's a problem. Uh, those watching on YouTube will realise that Margaret's video, uh, we've had to turn off for today's recording to make sure we get good audio as well. So actually, Margaret, I'm going to come to you. Let's go back in time. Uh, where did you do your... Und where did you do... Actually... When did you realise you wanted to be a scientist? Let's start there. Oh, my. Oh, that's an interesting one. I actually remember exactly how long ago or at what stage in my schooling, if I may put it that way. I yep. must have been 14, 15 years old. And I knew I wanted to do medical research, even though I didn't fully understand what that entailed. But I sort of understood uh, that, that it's um, an area that would help me to understand how our bodies work, uh, diseases. And it's funny that uh, because I remember our ministry of, we, we would have people come to our schools. I was in secondary school then, and they would bring us forms and ask, as to fill in what we wanted to become. And I truly believed what I put in there is what I would become. <laughs> and that's what I am today. I knew it was related to pharmacy and medicine, but I also knew it was neither of the two. And so I pursued that path and that's what I'm, I'm doing now. Yeah. <laughs> well, to have, to have that vision and to see it through, uh... It's not all that common, actually, uh, especially at uh, the young age of 14. Uh, although, obviously, some even younger see that, that vision through. And Karen, what about you? What, where did you when did you first realise you wanted to become a scientist? So I think for me, that was when I was doing my undergraduate project work in my um, third year. And I was doing a parasitology project. Um, and module with um, the then Dr. Hilary Hurd at Keele University and um, just got completely hooked on parasitology and particularly tropical parasitology, looking at malaria and how it affected the mosquitoes actually rather than the, uh, rather than the person um, and um, so got hooked in that way and then went on to do a master's at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and just became more and more convinced that that was an area that I wanted to to work in. So, uh, Margaret, so you were at school when you decided science was your way forward. So where did you do your first degree? I did my first degree at the University of Nairobi and I did a degree in zoology. So that's why I did my first degree. And then I, I know you came over to the UK. When did you come over? What what years were you uh, working, studying in the UK? So what happened is after my first degree, I did join Camry as an assistant research officer. And I still had aspirations to do my master's. And I specifically wanted to do my master's in the UK. And I had an opportunity to come and do my master's degree at the University of Salford where I did uh, a master's in biochemical, oh, is it, um, bio, bio, I, I, I'm forgetting what, what master's degree I did, but I did my, my, my master's degree at the University of Salford in Greater Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have to ask, there's two questions that just immediately spring to mind. 
Firstly, why yes. why come to the UK? Second, I, I, yes, well, good, yes. let's answer that one first. Why why come to the U? Why the UK to study? I don't know. I just uh, I, to be honest, I, I don't know how to answer that question. But I just believe that uh, I would get a better better exposure than I would otherwise if I had done my masters here in Kenya. Um, I don't know whether that is, was true then, but it's just a desire that I had. And I was really focused on coming to the UK to do my master's. Well, I'm, I'm sure it probably did have a benefit uh, at that point. Do you think coming to the, going overseas is still as important as it was then for, for students coming through? Do you think you'd, would you recommend them going overseas to do further studies? Or would you say, no, 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 stay in Nairobi, stay in Kenya, everything, you know, we've moved on, things are moving forward. What What's your feelings about that? I think um, it depends on, uh, on several things, especially at master's degree level. So, for example, if, you, if a person has done their first degree and they are engaged, they are employed, they are working in an institution like Cambridge, and they are working... Uh, within a team that is well networked, then I, they, they, you know, they, it may not be necessary to go out there fully because you get the exposure that then prepares one for the whether as here we are speaking of research. But I still think you get a better exposure when you go out of Kenya mm -hmm. to do, um, you know, any type of degree. And especially from master's degree level onwards. Well, I, I will support that because actually I think regardless of which country you're in, uh, there's always something to be gained by moving institutes, moving countries, working yeah. in a different culture. And, and that's so actually from UK students, postgraduate stuff, going overseas, a lot of those gone to succeed at quite a, an accelerated rate in, in many cases. But it's not essential, and it's good to hear it's not essential either uh, with yourselves. Karen, have you, oh, I know, I'm going to come back to one more question. Margaret, you chose Salford, Manchester. Now, whilst we're recording this, I'm looking out my window at a relatively dry place in the country called York. And today it looks like Manchester weather. It's raining. How did you cope with the, the changing climate coming from Nairobi into Manchester on the west side of the country that does get a little bit more rain than many other parts of the country. Well, incidentally, uh, just before I went to for, to do my master's degree, I had gone out in the field in a very remote place in Kenya where uh, we have the highest prevalence of hydatid disease in, in humans. And while on that trip, uh, we were joined by a British woman who was an artist. I believe her name was also somebody. And I asked her, so what should I expect in Manchester? And then she said, it's Manchester is rain, 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 and then winter. So I was kind of prepared in that way. But it was not too much of a price to pay for me because I was very, very passionate about going to the UK for the first time. So, And I was born and raised in a, one of the coldest areas in my country. So, it, and you know, also rainy. So but I think the excitement... Um, I, I didn't think it was too much of a price to pay, but it was exciting, but a bit cold, uh, you know, both the weather and just being there for the first time. So, <clears throat> but I think I was too excited that that, that was small inconvenience for me. I, I, guess <laughs> yeah, I, so, yeah. I, I will caveat that actually we hold our, to the Royal Microscopical Society, hold their big meeting every other year in Manchester and all my views and memories of Manchester are very sunny and warm days. So it's just more rainy compared to others, but actually I really got a very soft, very fun soft spot for Manchester itself. Uh, how, how did you find the, the cultural change coming and studying in the UK with around UK students? Uh, was that, was that, uh, a, probably a bigger challenge, the cultural change in seeing some students and their behaviors sometimes, uh, and how they, how things are different compared to, is that a bigger challenge than the weather, the climate change fitting in? 
Yeah, it, it, it was, uh, I think it was a bigger challenge and yet I don't remember feeling too overwhelmed because I think I had done my due diligence, I had kind of prepared myself and then there happened to be quite a number of um, other African students from Africa and in fact a good number from Kenya and we sort of were all connected but uh, the, the cultural change was obviously something that I needed to deal with. Uh, anyway, I was only there for one year, so it was not too bad. <clears throat> yeah, yes. I, I'm thinking actually when I did my undergraduate, there were quite a lot of Kenyan uh, in the same cohorts from Kenya. And actually, I did, I, maybe the culture, maybe I was so young, I didn't notice cultural differences because we were all in the same cohort. So I don't think it made a big difference to the students at that point. We were, it was all new to us all uh, at that point. Karen, you've been over to Kenya, you've been over to Kenya and visited Margaret and spent two, three weeks over there. How did you find the cultural change going the opposite way? So well, I spent a week there in December last year, and um, it was it was great actually. Again, a little bit of homework and asking questions before uh, before travel certainly certainly paid off. And uh, Margaret and the team at Kemri were uh, very helpful in making sure that the accommodation in the hotel was in the was in the right area, and so that wouldn't have trouble um, getting across town. Um, although I did use an Uber for the first time in in Kemri, I'd never done Uber transport before, so it was quite uh, quite strange doing that for the first time uh, to get across across the city to um, arrive um, at the research institute. But the taxi driver didn't know quite where to go and missed the turning for um, for for Kemri, so it didn't turn off left. So then I got a, a, a bit of an extended tour of the area around the research institute. So certainly got to see um, a lot more of the the, um, of the city than the, they intended to that morning. And Karen, I, I know from working with you, you have a passion for working and supporting Africa as mm -hmm. a whole. And where did that passion come from? I don't know if I've ever asked you this. Where, where did that passion come from? Because you're always on at me to go over to Africa. Uh, and support different research groups over there. And that's not just supporting, that's because you're interested and want to be, visit the countries. So where's your passion come from? So I think that came from, um, again, when I was doing my um, undergraduate degree, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, uh, went over to Tanzania for six months and went out to join for a month and saw how the research at Muheza operated there. That's an MRC research institute. And I was just absolutely bowled over by what they were doing with the limited resources and the expertise and the knowledge and the way that they pinned things together to you know, get as much as they can out of the time and the research activities they had. So it was from doing that and you know going around the different villages and collecting the mosquitoes from the huts in the morning to then do the testings and uh, you know helping helping with that where I could. Um, really made me think that you know there was a lot of work to be done with the ne neglected tropical diseases, but also just the, the people and the spirit and the character and the want to do more and that there was a lot more to be done. Um, so yeah, really came from that experience. And then from doing the masters and seeing the work that was being done and yeah how much more was needed to be done to move treatment diagnosis as well as basic biology on have you uh ever been tempted to move over to africa uh, obviously when you retire you're not leaving me but <laughs> <laughs> would you ever be tempted to go and live over there no i don't think so i think what what i could see was that i wanted to i don't know in prove the capacity of the people that were doing the research over there to do the research themselves and to get the expertise and the reagents and the equipment to be able to then you know move things forward for for their own research so i think that's quite a a driver in my mind is that it's nice to help and support but you know the, the researchers that are over there from certainly from from Kemri are excellent and brilliant in their own way and so capacity building and facilitating 
their enhancement is probably more of interest to me. So, Margaret, coming back to you, Karen raised two points that when Karen visited, I, I guess, over 20 years ago, that that's for sure, uh, when Karen visited and saw what the science has been done on limited resources. Uh, would you say that resources are still so limited or how are things looking uh, within Kenya? Are, are there far more in the way of technology support and infrastructure now in place or is it still on a more limited basis compared to most Western European countries and North America? First of all, to, for me to answer that question, I would need to say that uh, okay, the resources are much better today than they were 20 years ago. However, uh, most of the research that we are doing in our settings in Kenya, and I believe in the, in the region, um, most of it um, is in partnership with uh, you know, groups or you know, institutions from the Western world. So in that context, and depending on the funding on, uh, you know, that is based, you know, uh, the capacity is based on how well funded projects are. Uh, but in terms of funding from uh, the government, if I speak for, you know, from my experience in Kenya, there's not that much funding for research coming directly from, you know, say, for example, the exchequer yeah. to do research. There's funding to, you know, to pay salaries and to, you know, to, to manage the research institutions. But in terms of hard cash currency to do research, uh, that may not have changed much, although certainly in our situation, our government has been increasing the, you know, funding for research. And I, um, yeah, so I think that's what I can say. But otherwise, it's important to note that majority of the research going on in the region is often in partnership with, uh, you know, institutions from the Western world. And is that a good thing? Uh, this is my personal opinion. I, I'm glad I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for Kemo. Of course. Yeah. My, my opinion is that it's, we really should own our problem and our governments and as a people in a community, we should, you know, allocate more funding to solve our own problems. Because, you know, honestly, when funding is based on or driven by outsiders, then it may not be, you know, addressing our most important and immediate needs. Yeah, yeah. It, would be, it would be nice if there was a, you know, a Kenyan research council that would have a call for proposals and then the researchers and the clinicians or such like could put a proposal in, they could be reviewed and then funded from government money um, accordingly. Um, I think that would be a, a, nice, a nice aim. Does that happen for any area of research, Margaret? Well, we do have a, we have a forum uh, where we we get funding, uh, you know, based on you know calls for you know for applications. But that's only like a, a drop in the bucket compared to the very sizable research going on in in Kenya, for example, most of which is funded by. Um, you know, it's driven by and funded by, you know, individuals from the United States or UK and a lot. And I think especially we have a strong, big presence of the US uh, here, but we do have um, some funding that comes um, that people can apply for. But um, as generous as some of the funding and grants can be, it's only at you know a drop in the bucket when you compare to the budgets that are you know being run here from NIH or Wellcome Trust or yeah, you know or uh, EDCTP and, and 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 you know other funding agencies and bodies. 
I, I, if I can turn this on its head a little bit, I, I just just thinking out loud with this, Margaret Cameron, I actually think maybe I, I think yes, more national funding in any country is always, especially because we scientists, we want to see funding in our direction so we can see what we can do with it. So we we all want more. <clears throat> One of the beauties is a lot of the UK funding is for UK researchers. Uh, obviously, there are some funds now that enable collaborations overseas. But increasingly, you know, science is without borders. And, you know, collaborations are encouraged to work with the best people in the best places, in the best lo local local places that are suited. And actually, this this funding that we're talking about, which is, in our case, the, the European, the EDCTP funding, and you, you mentioned Wellcome Trust and NIH funding, the great thing is, it means that we're all working together. And actually, UK, a lot of UK scientists work in the UK with UK scientists and don't branch out. These funding streams that are there, uh, which I guess for us are maybe the minority funding, but it's some of the most successful funding. It's ones where you are collaborating with the best positioned people overseas as well, such as with yourselves. Uh, so there are it's kind of you're coming from another side of, of a problem of just getting that global scientific economy going. Uh, I guess maybe it's ownership of the money and, and who can lead and stuff. Maybe that's a perceived problem, maybe, Margaret. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I get the question. No, um, so maybe it's, uh, <laughs> you know, who goes looking for collaborators? Is it... The Western world looking into Africa, looking for collaborators, or is it collaborate, or is it the groups, the, the academic groups in uh, Africa, in, in Kenya, in your case, looking for collaborators into Europe and into America? Which which way are the partnerships led quite often, or is it a mix of both? I think it's a mix of both, but uh, most of the times we have, uh, you know, the Western, uh, you know researchers from the western parts of the world looking for partnerships in africa um uh, you know i think that's because for example you'll find that uh, um you have a funding agency uh that insists that uh, for them to fund research in kenya you must have uh a, a, the lead persons coming from the country where the money is originating from. A good uh, case example is, um, you know, like grants and funding that uh, we get from Japan. Uh, so you get some funding, but most majority of the organizations, they are funding coming in. They insist that because the, the funding is derived from Japanese taxpayers, then you must of necessity have a Japanese as part of the lead team uh, then that is partnering with the Kenyan team. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can see that. And I think, I, I think you know, if Kenya were to liberate more funds for research, you'd certainly want to make sure that Kenyan academics were benefiting at home as well as mm -hmm. collaborating outside of Kenya. Uh, so I, I, I guess I can see why that would have to be the case itself. Uh, I, I'm going to just change tack for the moment. What are the, uh, which conferences do you get to go to? Uh, Margaret, actually, no, Karen first. Karen, what conferences have you attended in the last 12 months or so? So for um, international conferences, the um, uh, CITO conference that was in Montreal this year, so that's ISAC's flow cytometry or cytometry based yearly meeting so I attended attended that um, and then we have our national flow cytometry UK meetings as well that I've attended and um, I've also attended the Royal Microscopical Society the RMS one day um, AGM and then the um, conference in Manchester this year as well so um, a good 
selection of flow cytometry and microscopy um, meetings and the facilities meeting as well for flow cytometry. So quite a number across different disciplines that helped me do my job here at York. What's your favourite meeting, Karen? Oh, so <laughs> I just have two. So internationally for, for abroad, that would be Cyto. That's an amazing meeting of lots of different cytometrists from across the globe. And it's nice to see Cyto friends um, and uh, catch up with them as to what equipment, what techniques, what reagents they're using. Um, but for the um, national meeting, it'll have to be the facilities meeting that's held um, in January. I, I really like that meeting. Um, for more of the facilities management and cytometry usage, equipment, how to manage people and employers and vendors and all such things as that. So, so it's not MMC? Karen. No, no well, I'm, MMC. Joking, I'm joking, Karen. You're in an impossible position to, to come back at it. <laughs> uh, uh, Margaret, same question to you. Have you been to many conferences, congresses in the last year or two? Uh, I haven't been to, actually, I haven't been to any conference. Well, I have been to a conference, the LIP uh, platform. Um, so I haven't been to many conferences since uh, COVID, <laughs> since 2020. So, but I have been to, uh, we, we, we at Camry have an annual conference that comes up in, in February. Uh, Cam Camry Annual Scientific uh, Con and Health Conference. It's very vibrant. It happen It happens every every February. So I've been in that one every year. The, I mean, for as long as I can remember. Whenever we have had that conference, um, I, I we also have uh, the other conference that I have loved attending is the World Leash. Conference. Unfortunately, I didn't attend the last one. The last one I attended was in Toledo, in Spain, and then um, I've attended uh, the ASTMH. Um, I think the last one I attended was in twenty. The, this, I think, is the first time that we've mentioned uh, leash leishmaniasis, uh, which a lot of the research that Karen, Margaret, you're both working on uh, from York side, led by Paul K. Uh, so, for those listening that aren't familiar with leishmaniasis, who would like to describe uh, what leishmaniasis is for the for the audience that may not know what what we're talking about? I think Margaret would be best placed to describe that, as it's uh, endemic in her host national country. So, Margaret, over to you to describe what leash is. I think. Okay, so leishmaniasis is a parasitic disease. It's actually one of the most neglected tropical diseases. Um, and it is caused by uh, uh, the leishmania parasite, which is uh, uh, a protozoan that is transmitted by through the bite of a sunfly. And um, so um, we, we have leishmaniasis. Can, we have different types of leishmaniasis. So we have the visceralizing leishmaniasis, and uh, which is what is common in, in our East Africa region. Um, and uh, we also have the cutaneous form of leishmaniasis, where the parasite uh, resides, in, you know, uh, does not visceralize, but stays on the skin. Um, we also have other forms of, you know, skin, uh, Based leishmaniasis, uh, like mucosal form of the disease, uh, that we, we don't have it ourselves here in the East Africa region, but it's common in the Latin Americas. Um, in our settings here, we have uh, the visceral leishmaniasis, which is which, which is actually fatal and affects the poorest of the poor. And in our setting, it's endemic. In, the, in the areas where we have nomadic uh, communities that travel a lot uh, with their cattle. And uh, if untreated, uh, the visceral leishmaniasis is actually fatal. Um, and we, the, the work we are doing with Karen is really, you know, based on our desire to understand the immunological processes underlying 
the pathogenesis of human visceral ischemiasis. Um, I, I don't know whether that is sufficient to answer no, the question of what uh, leishmaniasis is. Actually, I think that's perfect, Margaret. I think that's a really good explanation. And what we didn't put on there is the numbers of the number of people that have been infected or infected with leishmaniasis, making it one of the world's biggest diseases mm-hmm. out there. I, I think maybe the third largest biggest disease Globally, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it is really, really big and, and does have, but it, as we heard, can be deadly, uh, which is why the research is, is so fundamentally important uh, to, to be undertaken. Now, our, our side is flow cytometry. So why is it, I'm going to ask Karen this one because Margaret's just asked that one. Why is a flow cytometer so important to this research? So the reason why we've chosen to buy the flow cytometers and put them in situ in the four countries involved in the project is so that we can monitor the immune responses of the participants in the study in in real time and look at their immune responses um, uh, pre and post treatment for visual leishmaniasis, for leishmaniasis um, Donovani. And... um, this will help us see how their um, immune profile changes after um, treatment. Um, often the people that have got parasite, their, their immune responses are quite different to a healthy person and to see how it shifts after after treatment. The treatment takes quite a while and the drugs are um, quite harsh on the body. Um, so the the participants need to be or the patients need to be hospitalized during during treatment Um, and so it's thought that maybe in the different sites the immune profile will be different in Kenya to let's say Ethiopia or or Sudan Um, and um, so to really unpick some of that with uh, got four panels um, to look at different parts of the immune responses and um, see if there are differences that can be observed that can help understand the cell biology and immunology better. Thank you, Karen. And <clears throat> part of thinking of keeping on the technology side of this, just having a flow cytometer or any bit of technology to underpin the research question or whatever aspect you're looking at, <clears throat> isn't as simple as just putting the technology into the country. Uh, <clears throat> you need training. But you need engineers to be able to put it in the country, set it up and support it. And Margaret, you mentioned earlier, uh, in our case, it's Beckman Coulter who have supported it uh, very efficiently. But also Beckman Coulter and some of the other big companies, not just cytometer companies, do invest a lot of money, time and effort in supporting research uh, in African countries such as Kenya. And I presume Coulter have been a good partner in this case, Margaret? Yes, uh, I, th- I think they have been. Um, <clears throat> we have been able to use our our cytometer well, con- continua- continuously since we started our project without having any major issues. And- um, yeah, yeah. So, and whenever, we, as I said earlier, whenever we have had an issue or two, like misalignment of the lasers with the cytometer, uh, we were able to call in a, a, a Beckman Coulter uh, engineer, came and sorted out so that a short notice. So, we haven't had any major issues. Um, and likewise with ours, which is a parallel system, a sister system, a sister system. That's hard to say, sister system. I'm not going to say it too fast. Uh, And we've had very few problems with ours, which is good. Uh, But Karen, that's part of the logistics. Uh, Can I ask you what the most difficult logistic was of getting the cytometers distributed? Because they all came to York to start with. Actually, I have a picture of this. Margaret, I hope you can see your screen. This was actually when all the cytometers came to York first, not because they were p- purchased in the UK. That wasn't the case. These were going to Kenya or to Sudan or to Uganda or to Ethiopia. <clears throat> but we wanted them all on site so everyone could be trained on their cytometer. And we we could all check that all cytometers were equal before 
they then got distributed. And so that gave sort of a level of insurance. But so here we are all at York being trained. And actually, I have this picture, which we'll post up as well. Uh, so, Margaret, you're also in this picture. Just here. That's me. <laughs> and we've got Karen. Obviously, you can see. Well, actually, Karen's looking the other way. Uh, Paul Kay, who from York was a project lead from York side and others from the consortium. So, Karen, what was the biggest challenge? So, so th th I think the biggest challenge could probably describe as um, uh, transportation of instruments and reagents then to the sites. Now, that was partly due to COVID, but also the restrictions and the processes and the licenses and the certifications for each of the four countries to actually ship the cytometers and the reagents was different. And um, it was really difficult to get a tick list or a checklist for each country to decide what needed to happen. Um, and COVID also got in the way, which meant it was very hard to get hold of people to tell you what you needed. But also it seemed to be that sometimes people said, yes, you definitely need this. It's absolutely important you get this. And then we'd get all of that. And then somebody say, oh, no, you didn't need that one. And you now need this as well. And this caused delay after delay after delay. And it got very difficult and very frustrating. And so, um, so they, they were the biggest problems. And I knew you'd pick out the, the imp export import hmm. difficulties, challenges that, that lay ahead that we hadn't fully foreseen. No one had. No one had. We, we, we looked into it before we started this. And we thought we'd learned everything and heard what everyone was advising. But ultimately, things change and it makes more difficult. And thinking of things changing, the whole project, Margaret, uh, has obviously taken quite a big hit recently with the uh, changes in Sudan uh, and the difficulty it's made engaging with some of the samples because they had a lot of our, the samples for the consortium. That's obviously had a big hit as well. I don't know. Margaret, has that affected you much in Kenya for this, the research side itself of the project? Uh, we, we, fortunately, we, at the beginning of uh, this project, actually, even during the, you know, the development of the grant application, where when we were doing risk assessment, I remember clearly thinking. Uh, that uh, we would be having an, an election during the time of this project. And that can sometimes in our settings can, you, sometimes you never know what will happen. Uh, uh, but luckily we had our election and it was peaceful. We also had some uh, security issues because the, the study sites where we are doing uh, the recruitment of uh, study participants are in a you know in a zone where we as I said the the, the this knowledge analysis in our settings affects and you know nomadic communities so sometimes you have two communities that are always fighting and you know cattle rustling and where you know and it can be turned very very nasty and so we have had some curfews. In, instituted by the the leadership in those counties, uh, but somehow we we have managed to go to work around it. I can't say that it has you know affected us too much in terms of getting our enrollments and things like that. So we haven't had uh, major national security issues, but we have had regional security issues that occurred within the areas of where we have the study on you know going ongoing it, it's odd isn't it to think that science is our key problem that that's what we're all here to help solve and move forward with and yet this this project over the last three four years has been beset by covid being quite a big impact of how we could all work together i would say covid has possibly helped in an odd way because the use of Zoom and networking, everything developed so fast that actually being able to do remote support and the groups 
all meeting on a weekly basis, talking about their problems, looking at the flow data live on their cytometers uh, has been really useful. So maybe there are some benefits that we, we forget about, but the negatives, of course, are not being able to, to move between the countries as easily. And Karen, you were flying out to Sudan and then got cancelled at the last minute. Yeah, so we were we were due, well. Margaret was uh, expected to to come as well. We were going to have our um, AGM meeting for the project um, in Khartoum, um, and uh, that was booked scheduled to happen. I think it was well three weeks or four weeks um, after the 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 war broke out. So. Um, yeah, so that's had a, an impact on our ability to meet, certainly this year, because obviously we, we, we didn't go. Um, and, you know, we, we're not sure what's happening with the flow cytometer at the minute in Khartoum. Um, we're not sure whether it will still be in a fit state or whether the computer will still be attached. Um, the hope is that it, it will be OK and it will be moved out of Khartoum to the field site. So some of the research capabilities can still continue, but that's, you know, up for, for, for discussion and negotiation in, in, in time on and not really for now. Fortunately, all the researchers are are OK. They're safe, which is the, the main thing. Um, but it's it's had a big knock to, to, the, to the project. Well, I think credit to everyone involved, though, that, you know, this is this was a large amount of funding. It was a very, you know, it's a big project with a number of groups uh, across the world as part of this collaboration. And despite these negative impacts, that I think everyone's found ways to work around it and to keep moving forward and to carry on delivering impact uh, for the funds, despite COVID, despite you know, the problems that Sudan are currently uh, facing at the moment. And I think that's a real credit to all the scientists involved in these projects. And this is just one project we're talking about. There's lots of projects out there that will be doing exactly the same. And thank goodness that the funders still support the funding because mm -hmm. research does need to go on. And I think that's been really useful. Karen, I'm going to stick with you for a moment, please. Uh, so obviously, you're chair of the flow cytometry section for the Royal Microscopical Society, but you're also a committee member at ISAAC. Uh, and they're one of their working groups or task forces, uh, which is, well, Karen, you tell me about the task force that you're involved with. So the, the, the task force has the, the name Instruments for Science or the acronym of I4S. And so the, the 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 thought behind this is instruments that are still fit for purpose, but surplus to requirements at an institution can then be donated to um, a site that needs a flow cytometer and they don't currently have one and they don't have the means to purchase one either. To get them started with flow cytometry, provide an instrument that is, again, I reiterate, fit for surface. It is, it is not a dead duck. Um, and provide the maintenance and the startup pack in terms of reagents and expertise and training to, to get the, the work going and then to support that from the live education committee of ISAC as well so that the training can happen maybe initially virtually but then in person to make sure that the equipment can be used to full capacity at the site. And this has worked really well um, with uh, Zosha and also Bill Telford, supported also by Rafe and Alfonso um, to move projects on when there is an absolute need for flow cytometry to happen at that site, but there's not the funds to get it started. And the aim would be nicely to then capacity build through grants or collaboration um, support to then, you know, maybe further on get a new cytometer or different reagents to then um, have increased capacity and self-sustaining use of a cytometer in the in the future so that's the brief aim for it and i think karen i i think it was really important you, you emphasize it wasn't a dead duck i mean, the collaboration we have here took a different approach in putting new equipment in which has a long lifetime then and can be supported to have a, a legacy going beyond the grant period itself in this case this is bringing things in much cheaper we have talked to bill telford and co instruments that can still be supported, even though in Europe you wouldn't, it's not so easy to support them and keep them going. But there are 
charitable efforts to keep them going in Africa. And uh, Bill Telford flies over and helps go around different cytometers, fixing them. Yes. He's got his workshop that he makes parts for and everything else, uh, which, which makes it harder, but it does keep them going. So we, it's not going for scrap at that point. Uh, actually, so actually a, a shout out to us at York, and I'm going to say is, you know, we have our confocal microscope going out to Nigeria, uh, actually shipped out this morning, uh, which, which is great news because we actually had secondary parts that we could send with it. And we knew they had some parts also. So we know it's going to have a lifetime, not just a one or two years, but they should see at least five years worth of active use, uh, which is, I think, a good thing. And Margaret, what's your thoughts on accepting those, you know, end of life, but not end of life systems? What was the term you used, Karen? Instruments? Fit for purpose, I think I said, but, okay. but it's instruments for science. Yes. What are your thoughts about those types of equipment versus new, Margaret? Uh, do you mean um, equipment that uh, come in outside of uh, an ongoing project? Yeah, and so Karen, you describe how the instruments would, would be coming in, and so so the the institution would put a request in for a you know flow cytometer and maybe some peripheral equipment, maybe a centrifuge as well, or you know, whirly mixer, and then would be um, for a particular project to get them started or even a series of projects even, um, so that it'd be used to good capacity. And then there would be um, funds raised or funds um, donated to then get the equipment and some training so it can be used properly to the inst institution. And that can be done independently or um, in the past we've used Seeding Labs, which is a company um, from works out of the, out of the States that helps also facilitate places get kitted up with donated but fit for purpose equipment. So this would be like, for example, calibers and calibers are probably one of the most donated systems into that, fax calibers. Uh, so nothing like what you have, Margaret, with the, the Cytoflex uh, LX, which is a high-end system. But are those type of instruments still useful? You know, would you, is there a culture of wanting these instruments or is it, well, these are secondary instruments. I, I want the latest to be able to push my search, research to limits. What What's the balance here? I, I think for me, uh, that would be a very good uh, uh you know, sometimes you you may want to apply for funding or there may be some funding available that is enough to do certain research work if only you had a certain equipment to do A, B, C, D. And sometimes that equipment doesn't need to be the, you know, bit of the art. It may be just some basic basic you know equipment so i think uh, i think this is a noble idea uh and i i think i would welcome that very much so i think personally i think i think you know researchers can and different labs certainly within our settings can actually benefit a lot from such a um a, a venture uh, sometimes you may have a lab that has the fancy equipment, but you may you may be in need of just a basic equipment, an equipment to do really basic stuff that are continuously being, you know, that you need to do, uh, even in a routine lab. Eh? So I think it's, I welcome that kind of an idea. Uh, and of course, it has to. There has to be a balance between the, you know, um, the situation where you, you know, maybe a certain recipient institution or country may, may want to query that whole arrangement so that it doesn't seem like uh, then a, a, a lab here in Camry, you know, sorry to use this word, becomes almost like. A, if you allow me to use this, maybe I don't fully understand that whole arrangement. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's not, you're getting an equipment 
that you, you, you know has a long usage time and therefore it's not like you are getting rid of, you, are, you, know, you want to get rid of, dispose of an equipment and, you know, that you don't want in your space. But otherwise, I think it's a very welcome idea. Uh, very, very welcome. Very welcome. So, so Margaret, um, what you don't want to be is a dumping ground. I think I was avoiding the use of that, that word. I'll okay. say it for you, so we don't have to edit it out. It comes out of my mouth. So it, it shouldn't be a dumping ground. It has to be instruments that have longevity. Yes. Can enable support. And sometimes it is the more, not the top end systems, but the yeah. workhorse systems that do have better longev longevity compared to the, to some of the very niche systems. Karen, you were going to say something. Yeah, Sorry. yeah I was just going to continue on from that. And a discussion that's been had um, quite actively at the minute is um, in terms of the training for use of, let's say, a flow cytometer um, and which language that should be given in. And um, so, Margaret, it, it, do you have a, a, a comment to make on um, use of training material in a native language or whether um, English stroke American um, is, is acceptable? In our settings, uh, our language of instruction, even at school, is English. So uh, I don't that I'm even aware of, uh, you know, within the research setting of a scenario where, you know, people use language other than English in terms of the SOPs, the training. So for us, I, I don't know about other countries in the, for example, in the East Africa region, but definitely, certainly for Kenya, English is the language of, um, it's actually the official language. Yeah. Our national language may be Swahili, but our official language is English. So training materials, whether it be SOPs or manuals, are all, all in English. Yeah, so we're just trying to work out in which countries then translations are maybe needed to help the technicians and some of maybe the early career researchers progress onwards. But it sounds like for Kenya, um, that that wouldn't that wouldn't be necessary to to do any translations. So uh, yeah, that that's a useful comment that just came into my head while we were while we were talking about that. So yeah, that that's that's good. That's nice to hear. So. We, we are moving into the last few minutes. So very quickly, Karen, how can people get involved? Um, with the ISAC for the Instruments for Science or the Live Ed Task Force. So if you have a look at the ISAC website, then there are details there for the chairpersons or the information. Um, so you can, can look at that and then email the, the chairs of the groups if you've got um, comments or you've got instruments that you think would be suitable for donations, then, you know, get in touch and we can send you details as to what information is needed. And uh, yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's, that'd be great to, to hear from anybody that's got something that is fit for purpose and could be utilised for, you know, further year service. And there are other initiatives out there that actually funding, charitable funding donations can really help. And obviously Bill Telford's podcast has some of this information, but Paul Robinson as well has initiatives mm. around this area mm. that are sit with Isaac and outside Isaac, but do look at those. And there's and, a donations page as well on the ISAC website for anybody that wishes to donate to contribute in terms of a monetary form to these types of activities. And it specifically goes to the civic task force or the civic mission that uh, that we've described. <laughs> so to end on, uh, Margaret, what do you l most like about working at Kemri? What do I most like? What do you uh, most like? I think um, the opportunity to live my dream of becoming a, a researcher. I think that's what I, you know, um, I like the most. And especially, I always have loved uh, being involved in research that I can see uh, becoming of immediate impact in the community. That is something that um, really I, I really like uh, that. Uh, motivates me. Uh, I know that the, the current project we are working on may, 
you know, that may not immediately uh, lead to something of direct impact in the community, but we are hoping that it will make a contribution somewhere down the line, and uh, uh, whether for prevention of visceral ischemiasis or, you know, a vaccine or what, you know, you know, when we decipher the mechanisms underlying the, the pathogenesis of the disease, who knows, we may identify a pathway that can eventually become a target for a, a drug intervention. So uh, I think what I love the most is my contribution to uh, the opportunity to con make a contribution in the understanding of uh, certainly for the purposes of the project that we are working with the University of York, uh, visceral ischemiasis, uh, my contribution to the understanding of the disease process and the hope that what that can lead to an intervention soon, sooner or maybe much, much later. Right. I know research is moving very nicely at the moment from the York side and, and the collaboration side. Karen, same question for you. What do you most like working about at York? I like the variety of what flow cytometry can offer to the department, but also the wider university. And also we're open access, so we collaborate and work with partners, you know, internationally as well. So um, I like the parasitology and the immunology and the flow cytometry. They would be my three mainstays. But I like the way that I can learn from the other disciplines and the other biologies that come in through our doors. And um, the other people that we work with are fantastic, um, you know, really good, really want to learn and push the science forward and are happy to listen and discuss. So I think it's a, a combination. And the team that we have. It's a good answer, Karen. It's not the right answer. The right answer is obviously working with me, but... Oh, no, I wasn't gonna wasn't gonna fulfil that <laughs> the, that tick box, Pete. I did say the team, and you're part of the team, so <laughs> head of the team. So <laughs> it's in the but mix somewhere. On that note, we are up to the hour. Thank you for everyone who's listened to this podcast. I apologise we haven't got all pictures today, but there'll be some. Hopefully, the pictures you see uh, will have kept it engaging. For those listening, thank you very much for listening. Please don't forget to subscribe to your favourite channel for this. But also, don't forget, go back and listen to Bill Telford. You can listen to Karen with Derek and learn more about Karen herself. Uh, Paul Robinson, you've heard uh, Alfonso Blanco, you've also heard. Go and catch up with their podcast as well. But Margaret, Karen, I wish you all the very best going forward with this project. I hope that you get to meet in person again. Uh, I know this year's meeting didn't happen. And I look forward to more collaborations and research in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.